We're going to get into chapter number 11 now in the book of Acts. What I'd like you to do, do, do something a little bit different now, just a little bit of a change of pace. Why don't you go to page 150, and uh, we're going to look at the applications here on page 150, and then we'll go back and read through the chapter. So uh, what I'd like to do is just talk about excuse me, some of the lessons that we'll, we'll be look, we will be looking at here in this particular chapter, and then we'll go back and read <clears throat> through it if we will, can. All right, let's start that over, okay? I'm going to do that over. That, I got a froggy in my throat. Thank you, Slava. <clears throat> We're going to try it again here. You can scratch that, throw it away, put it in the garbage can. That's <clears throat> ready. <sighs> okay. <clears throat> All right, we're going to move into Acts chapter number 11. We're going to do something a little bit different here, maybe a change of pace for us. I want you to go to page 150 in uh, your notebook. And uh, we're going to look at these applications here at the end, and then we'll work back through the chapter. This is a little, this is shorter than uh, some of the other lessons that we've done. But uh, let's pick up page 150. Let's just read through here together a little bit. Application. This chapter, chapter number 11, marks a very noteworthy turning point in the book of Acts. Peter will be seen again in chapter 12, picking up where we left off in Acts 11, 18. Then the focal point, or the epicenter of world evangelism, will shift from Jerusalem to Antioch. Remember, the book of Acts is a book of transitions, Old Testament to New, the life of Christ to the life of the church, and from the kingdom to Israel, the kingdom of heaven, if you please, to the kingdom of God here in the New Testament. So there's going to be a shift from uh, Peter to Paul. There will always be those who object to the working of God in new and fresh ways. However, nothing can hinder the mission if our resources are truly found in the Lord. Theology does not equate or is not equal with methodology. Our theology never changes. That is what we believe to be true about God and the principles, the theological principles of Scripture. But our methods do change. And we see that even here uh, in the book of Acts. The ways, the different ways or methods that people are reached with the gospel of Christ. The gospel is a means by which God can and will heal relationships. The rift between Jew and Gentile and all of the accumulated animosity can be buried and forgotten in Christ. And that's true of all relationships. We're one in Christ, and things that used to divide us can bring us together. There's a certain measure of comfort in a New Testament local church. When you're part of it, you can walk into a good Bible-believing church, not know anybody, but sit down and listen to the Bible being preached and feel right at home. How can we do that? And particularly... We need to be uh, individuals who are very welcoming of those who would visit with us. Don't forget that Jesus ate with publicans and sinners and that God is no respecter of persons. The mutual support provided by the Jerusalem church and the Antiochian church demonstrates the growth and the unity of the body of Christ. The famine relief indicates a complete reconciliation as needs are met across geographical in ethnic boundaries. In God's infinite wisdom, God knew that the city of Antioch was the ideal outpost for reaching the world with the gospel of Christ. Not Jerusalem. That's where Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost. The uttermost began to be reached through Antioch. Find out where God is working and get involved. Pay attention to your missionary uh, testimonies and your missionary letters and what God is doing in other parts, maybe other places in your city or in your state, country, maybe other places in the world. You may want to get involved in one of those. Well, let's go back to uh, the beginning, page 145. What was I that I 
could withstand God. God's moving. And what God does is unstoppable. What began as a small grassroots movement of a hundred or so followers of Jesus Christ in Jerusalem has exploded into the beginnings of a global phenomenon with men and women from all over the Roman Empire. Hearing the witness of the risen Lord and coming to repentance and faith and baptism and obedience to him. The church has come to realize full well that Jesus' instructions to go into all the world were not limited to the Jews, spread up, uh, uh, but to be spread abroad to all people in all nations. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. We're to be witnesses to go into all the world and preach the gospel. You can see our outline again there on uh, page number 145, divided into two main sections. Peter's action, he comes back and brings a report, is endorsed at Jerusalem. And then the church at Antioch of Syria, we begin to see the shift that we've talked about. This is a transformational chapter. We're moving from the Jew, not that we're abandoning the Jew, but the primary focus of the book then becomes Jew and Gentile, or maybe Gentile and Jew. There were certainly a lot more Gentiles in the world than there were Jews, and there was greater opportunity to win Gentiles just because of the volume, the sheer numbers of Gentiles, as opposed to the numbers of Jews living in the world uh, at that time. So Peter's action is endorsed at Jerusalem. That's our first 18 verses. And the church is then spoken of at Antioch of Syria in the remainder. Acts chapter 1, excuse me, Acts chapter 11, verse number 1. And the apostles and brethren that were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. You see that emphasis coming back? Wow, they were astonished. Man, the Gentiles are getting this too. And when Peter was come up to Jerusalem, they that were of the circumcision, the Jews, contended with him. They're, they're what are you doing, Peter? You're going into Gentiles. You're going to Gentile territory. They didn't understand. Now, Peter got it. He got the vision of the sheets. But many of the Jews still were prejudiced. They didn't get it, saying... Thou wentest in, verse 3, to men uncircumcised and didst eat with them. What's wrong with you? But Peter rehearsed the matter from the beginning and expounded it by order unto them, saying, gave them an account of what happened. I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision. A certain vessel descend as it had been a great sheet let down from heaven by four corners, and it came even to me. Upon the which, when I had fastened my eyes, I considered and saw four-footed beasts of the earth and wild beasts and creeping things and fowls of the air. And I heard a voice saying unto me, Arise, Peter, slay and eat. But I said, Not so, Lord, for nothing common or unclean hath at any time entered in my mouth. But the voice answered me again from heaven, What God hath cleansed, that call not thou common and this was done three times and all were drawn up again into heaven and behold immediately there were three men already come unto the house where i was sent i mean this is a you know he has the vision and then <laughs> there's a knock on the door i mean it's not difficult to connect the dots here this was pretty rudimentary and elementary for peter God wanted to make sure that he didn't miss the lesson in what, uh, his, what he was trying to get him to do. Behold, immediately there were three men already come unto the house where I, was, where I was, sent from Caesarea unto me, and the Spirit bade me go with them. Nothing doubted. Don't doubt. These, you're supposed to go with these people. You don't even have to question it. Moreover, these six brethren accompanied me, and we entered into the man's house. And he showed us how he had seen an angel in his house, which stood and said unto him, Send men to Joppa and call for Simon, whose name is, surname is Peter, who shall tell thee words whereby thou in all thy house shall be saved. 
And as I began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them as on us at the beginning. This is important, verse 15, because what is taking place in chapter number 10 that Peter is rehearsing in chapter number 11, verse 15, and as I began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them, the Gentiles, as on us, back in Acts chapter 2, is at the beginning. Then remembered I the word of the Lord, how that he said, John indeed baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. For as much then, as God gave them the like gift as he did unto us, who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, what was I that I could withstand God? I mean, this is plain as the nose on my face. I, I, I don't have any reasonable objection to what is taking place here. When they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, Then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. Now this is back in Jerusalem. We're in Acts chapter 11. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. What did they think? That the commandment or the commission was to go into all the world and preach the gospel only to Jews? You could find them? What were they thinking? They're still being astonished. They're still being uh, uh, surprised at what's taking place. And they're finally, with a testimony from Peter himself, they're beginning to connect the dots. All of chapter 10 focuses on the conversion of a Gentile, a Roman centurion and his family. Only Stephen's testimony in Acts 7 and the commissioning of Paul and Barnabas in Acts 13 are more lengthy chapters in Acts. Those are only two. This is the third longest chapter. Uh, that is chapter 10, not chapter 11, but chapter 10 is the third longest chapter in the book. These chapters are vital in understanding the progress of the gospel. What God has ordered will be carried out in spite of us. God will get his work done. Now, we shouldn't use that as a, an excuse for us to just kind of lay down and die. Please, don't do that. Well, God's going to get his work done. God has given us the privilege of partnering. We are co-laborers. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9. We are co-laborers with the Lord. We have the privilege and the opportunity of working, Acts chapter 10, with the Holy Spirit of God in bringing the truth of the gospel to lost men and women in this world. That's who we are. We're witnesses, co-laborers, arm in arm, locked with Jesus in the Holy Spirit of God, if you please, to go out there and bring the gospel of Jesus Christ. The shift is somewhat complete when the city of Antioch of Syria is introduced, where believers were first, in chapter 11, verse 26, they were called Christians in Antioch. And it's from Antioch that Paul launches his three missionary journeys. Actually, the second half of the book is broken up into about five major pieces. From chapter 13 to 28, there's five major pieces uh, things that take place. Three of them are Paul's missions trips. He does three missionary trips that are recorded. That's three of the five. The fourth is in Acts chapter 15 when the, uh, when the apostles get together at the Council of Jerusalem to get their theological acts together, to make sure that they're all doing and saying the same thing. The fifth thing in the book of Acts is basically Paul's journey when uh, he, was, uh, he was arrested and he made his appeal to Caesar and then his trip to Rome. And that's where the book of Acts ends up. Those are the five major things that take place in the second half of the book. Three missionary journeys, all that took place there, the council at Jerusalem and Paul's trip to Rome to stand before Caesar and answer the accusations against him. 
So anyway, um, Peter is confronted in verses 1 uh, through 3. We noted that, and we're not surprised. They, they of the circumcision, the Jews, contended with him. Uh, you went to uncircumcised people, and uh, that's a no-no. Then Peter rehearses the matter in verses 4 through 16 from the beginning. Essentially, he tells them the story of what has taken place, and we've read through that. We saw it in Acts chapter 10. I don't think we have to read through that again. And then we see Peter rehearsing it again here in chapter 11. And uh, there were six eyewitnesses, according to verse 12. Not one or two, but there's six eyewitnesses of what has taken place. And then verse 17, the text says that God gave them the like gift as he did unto us. Peter is simply saying this, that what happened to us at Pentecost happened to them. I saw it with my own eyes. It was important to validate, obviously, because the prejudice against the Gentiles, it was obvious that somebody of great authority, Peter, someone of great superior authority, Peter, would validate what was taking place. Now, they shouldn't have been surprised, but they were, which shows you, again, the um, prejudice that the Jewish people had at the time of the coming of Christ. And certainly, uh, they were mistaken in a lot of ways. First of all, they crucified Christ, and then they were mistaken that the gospel wasn't just for them, that uh, they, they uh, thought it was just for them. They were mistaken thinking it was, and uh, they were resistant to the fact that the gospel was going to the whole world. So Peter's explanation, verse 18 then, is accepted. They held their peace. They glorified God. Peter's story made sense, and coupled with his experience and his credibility, it was futile to argue with what had become the obvious facts. Now, more and more people are connecting the dots. The gospel is on the move. This was, and it was, chapter number 10. It was a God thing from both ends. Both ends. From Cornelius' end, from Peter's end, God brought this uh, meeting together. And we read that through that whole chapter we have to be impressed by the fact that God orchestrated this whole thing. It was a God thing. The audience then submits. They held their peace. They glorified God. They came to the obvious conclusion. Quote, Then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. <laughs> They're getting it. This is Jerusalem. Acts chapter 11. They're finally getting it. Before moving on, we've got to reiterate the fact that this is a major turning point in the history of the church. Never again will the Jews be in the majority from this point on. The gospel was moving to the world. So let's see what takes place here. In verse number 19, the church at Antioch of Syria in chapter 13, it's going to be the focal point. It's going to be the epicenter of Christianity. It's from that church in Antioch that Paul and Barnabas are sent to complete the mission, to go into all the world. And those three missionary trips that I spoke of just a few moments ago, that those three uh, missionary trips, they originate there in that church in Antioch, which is quite a distance away from the church in Jerusalem. Verse 19 says, Now they, which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen, traveled as far as Phoenice and Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word to none but unto the Jews only. You see that? That was their mentality up to this point. And some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, which when they were come to Antioch, spake unto the Grecians, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them. And a great number of these Grecians, these Antiochians, believed and turned unto the Lord. Then tidings of these things came unto the ears of the church, 
which was at Jerusalem, and they sent forth Barnabas that he should go as far as Antioch. So we've got uh, things are happening. The, uh, Christianity is bubbling right now. So this church at Antioch is now brought into the picture, and there's certain evangelists that went out who were only reaching out to uh, Jews, according to the text, but then they come to this church, in An this group of people in Antioch, not a church yet, they come to this group of people in Antioch and they begin to preach Jesus to them. But they're not, they're Grecians, they're Gentiles, they're not Jews, and they're getting, they're getting it. They're buying into this. They see that Jesus is the Christ. Well, messages are going back. You know, there's people in Antioch that are, they're doing the same thing. Well, they are in Caesarea too, Cornelius. That's happening there. But in Antioch, a similar thing is happening. So what the church in Jerusalem does is they send Barnabas to check it out. I want you to go up to Antioch there and see if what's going on is what happened in Caesarea with that Roman centurion. If that's what's happening there is what happened to us back in Acts chapter number 2. Is that what's taken place? So this is... Uh, uh, this is what is taking place. Let's look here in uh, verse 22. Then tidings of these things came under the ears of the church was it in Jerusalem, and they sent forth Barnabas that he should go uh, as, as far as Antioch, who when he came and had seen the grace of God was glad and exhorted them all that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. For he was a good man and full of the Holy Ghost and of faith, and much people was added unto the Lord. Then departed Barnabas to Tarsus for to seek Saul. Barnabas is, uh, we've got a mission. We, uh, Barnabas realizes that this message is spreading uh, more quickly all the time. And in essence, he's kind of volunteering himself, saying, you know, we got to, I got to do something about this. So he's looking for someone to be his partner, verse 25. And when he found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that uh, a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. So um, they're exchanging theological ideas. Barnabas and Paul, who has been with the disciples previous to this, the other the disciples at Jerusalem, uh, they're exchanging information and they're getting much more solidified in their New Testament theology, undoubtedly. They found him, they brought him to Antioch, 26. It came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves. They had a Bible institute, if you please. They made sure that what they were teaching was uh, sound theologically, that it was not heretical, that it was not contradictory of Scripture, and the disciples were, call, were called Christians first, not at Jerusalem, but in Antioch. And in these days came prophets from Jerusalem unto Antioch, and there stood up one of them named Agabus, and signified by the Spirit that there should be a great dearth of famine throughout all the world which came to pass in the days of Claudius Caesar. Then the disciples, every man, according to his ability, determined to send relief unto the brethren which dwelt in Judea, which also they did and sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. Well, anyway, time is going by. The church at Jerusalem is going through difficult times. Uh, place yourself. Put yourself in their shoes. The church in Jerusalem, uh, although there are many believers, numerically, they're still in a great, great minority. They're still in opposition to the Orthodox Jewish faith. They're being persecuted, undoubtedly. They also are no favorites of the Roman government in it's not clear exactly what took place, but there's no doubt that these persecutions and isolations and all the stuff that was going on to believers there in Jerusalem, that it 
created several hardships, many hardships on them. And not to mention that there was a dearth, there was a famine. So it was a food shortage on top of all of this stuff. So the church in, uh, in Antioch, um, after listening to people like Agabus, verse 28, um, listening to him, they realized that the church in Jerusalem was coming on tough times. And what they did is they sent from Antioch, Barnabas and Saul, they sent them back to the church in Jerusalem to encourage them, maybe to bring food, money, resources, supplies to help that church out back in Jerusalem. So the birthplace of Christianity, Jerusalem, Acts chapter 1, where Christ was crucified, that birthplace now finds itself in need. The gospel had to move from Jerusalem, had to move from Jerusalem, because Jerusalem came on some very difficult times. Jerusalem was short on resources, but Antioch was a much more favorable place, apparently economically, and consequently, those uh, individuals that were at Antioch were in a better position to begin to move the word of God to the then known world. Notice in verse number 19 on page 148, Stephen's death leads to world evangelism. The passage, verse number 19, takes us back to Stephen. Believers were scattered all around and ultimately the gospel uh, went to places, um, got, arrived at places that the disciples or apostles hadn't, in a firsthand way, uh, had actually sent people to take the gospel. The word was spreading by, maybe by word of mouth, I would say, which is the way it's supposed to spread, isn't it? In, uh, in verse number 20, we read that some of these men were taking liberties and preaching to Gentiles. And uh, that, rightly so. They were taking the gospel to the whole world, not just to the Jewish world. Letter B at the bottom of 148, Barnabas and Saul come to Antioch, 22 through 26, and they sent Barnabas um, to bring resources, to bring help. Look at the top of page 149. The church sends Barnabas to confirm the saints and the work in Antioch. Why Barnabas, the church of Jerusalem, wanted to check him out, what was happening, what was going on there. When he arrived, he saw the grace of God. His presence uh, uh, is rewarded with a great harvest. People are saved as a result of his visit there. He departed to seek Saul. They spent a whole year in the church, and uh, Christians are first uh, called Christians there at Antioch, verse 26 of chapter number 11. The fledgling churches, that is the church at Antioch, send relief to Judea. These final verses tie the Antiochian church back to the church of Jerusalem, the mother church, so to speak, where Christianity was born or birthed. The fact that the mother church needs the assistance of its children only further illustrates that the gospel is on the move in spite of the Jerusalem church. The last section serves primarily to tie Antioch back to Jerusalem to see the uh, connection between the two. The church in Antioch heeded the prophetic proclamation of Agabus, and as a result, the Christians in Antioch gathered together what they could, every man according to his ability, and sent relief, that is supplies, to the elders at Jerusalem, at the Jerusalem church by the hands of Barnabas and uh, Saul. Every man, according to his ability, determined to send relief. See, the responsibility falls on all of us. The responsibility falls on each and every Christian to care for the needs of the congregation of the church. We looked at that in a previous lesson. Maybe it was back in chapter 4, I think chapter 4, chapter 5, somewhere in there, we talked about that. But it's incumbent on all Christians to meet the needs of those who are in our body, in our local church. We ought to be on the lookout to be helpful and encouraging. 
and if need be, to bring resources, physical resources, if need be, to rescue those who are going through difficult times or maybe going without those things that are necessary. They did that. They reached out. They did things that uh, were very commendable, very generous. And there was, obviously, there was a tie among these people in the, this early church, a tie among these people that was uh, um, bonded them together in order to bond us together in our churches. It's easy to be separated, discordant, ununited, disunited, because we're very self-centered people. We are in it, naturally speaking, for ourselves. Survival of me is number one in my life, humanly speaking. It's not supposed to be that way, biblically, but it is that way. Now, there's a good part of that. It leads me to find food every day and to find shelter and to protect myself, to seek medical help when I need it. But it also separates me from people when I say me first and you second. So this early church really taught us some wonderful examples of mutual support and supporting one another. As the gospel was on the move, it was receiving resources from other places. Other places that were not complaining, resentful that there were other Christians in need, but they saw those needs as opportunities to get involved with them. Get involved in a, in a way that would show the true love of Christ to others. By this shall all men know that ye are my, dis my disciples, that ye have love one for another. And God so loved the world that he gave. Giving is probably the primary evidence that a person truly loves another individual. Going back to an earlier lesson, allow me to remind you of this. When people come to your church and your fellowship, they're looking for three things. Number one, they're looking for the truth. Number two, they're looking for hope. And number three, they're looking for love. They're looking to belong. They're looking to have other people accept them. And maybe not nearly as important, but they need to love also. So for those of you who may not be as loving, maybe you've been the object or the recipient of the generosity of other people. Remember where that stuff, remember the, where those resources came from. Because you need to be, and maybe it's your turn, you need to be just as generous with others and the needs of others as some have been with you. Chapter 11, it's a turning point. In chapter 12, we'll see Peter again, but we'll see him essentially for the last time, and the baton will be passed the baton will be passed from Peter to Paul the Apostle. When we move into chapter number 13, we'll see Paul and Barnabas being sent on what we know today as the first missionary journey. We're going to stop at this point, at the end of chapter number 11, and um, take some time to go back and review your notes, read through them again, refresh your mind with them, and when we come back, we'll come back to Acts chapter 12.